and welcome back to What the Health. I'm Julie Rovner, Chief Washington Correspondent for KFF Health News, and I'm joined by some of the best and smartest health reporters in Washington. We're taping this week on Thursday, August 8th at 10 a.m. As always, news happens fast and things might have changed by the time you hear this. So here we go. We are joined today via video conference by Sandia Raman of CQ Roll Call. Good morning. And Shafali Luthra of the 19th. Hello. No interview this week, but plenty of news for a hot summer week, so we will get right to it. So for the second time in three weeks, we have a new vice presidential nominee to talk about. Newly minted Democratic nominee Vice President Kamala Harris has chosen former congressman and current Minnesota governor Tim Walz to be her running mate. What do we know about Walz's record on health care? We know a lot. I think it's easier to kind of draw from his record compared to J.D. Vance, who's was only elected for the first time in 2022. Tim Walz has had six terms in the House. He's on his second term as governor. And from that, you know, you can kind of see what his priorities are, how he's kind of drawn from his personal experience and the things that he's been doing that are very in line with what either Biden and Harris or just Harris have, have done. When we had Biden, we hear a lot of talk about capping insulin costs. And that's something that Wall signed a Minnesota bill for a few years ago. And he's also been very active in reproductive health issues. He signed a couple abortion-related laws last year. That's been key focus of the Harris and Biden-Harris campaigns. He's been, you know, active in talking about IVF and how his family has used that, also pretty in line with that. And I love that he had a daughter using IVF whose name is Hope. Yeah, yeah. Very Midwestern. Yes. And I think he's also been pretty active on some of the like veterans issues as former member of the Army National Guard for several years and just some of the like education and health issues as a as a former teacher. And he signed legislation related to gender affirming care as governor. So I think we have a pretty good idea of the types of things that he'd be interested in if they were elected. And I think what's striking as well is how in line he seems to be on so many policy fronts to what we know of the vice president and frankly what we know about the other people who were in contention for the vice presidential nomination. And what I think that tells us is how unified a lot of the party is right now on health care and health policy issues in general. I was pretty struck by how quickly we got reactions from both pro-abortion race groups and anti-abortion race groups as soon as the news came. SB April Life America, one of the biggest anti-abortion groups, is quick to say this is the most pro-abortion ticket in history. You know, they might be right. Um, I but was going to say, I think it's they, probably true. Yeah. <laughs> and they could have said that about any Harris, et cetera, ticket, whether that was Walls, whether that was Shapiro, whether that was someone else from her reported list of finalists. And at the same time, what we saw from abortion rights advocates is they are equally thrilled about this because they look at Walls as an ally. They look at the work that was done in Minnesota around getting rid of abortion bans, codifying abortion rights in the state constitution, limiting requirements like the 24-hour waiting period that is gone in the state, and passing a shield law. All of that underscores that he is very in line with the vice president. I think what what's worth asking ourselves is how much does that matter when we have someone like Kamala Harris who is very interested in these issues? And in a way, we know far less about J.D. Vance, but whatever we could find out about him probably matters a lot more because... Donald Trump has never shown much interest in healthcare or health policy. So if we did get a Trump Vance ticket, it feels like there is a real possibility we'd have a lot more Vance influence in this area as opposed to Walls in a Harris Walls administration. Which we'll get to in a second. Just some, something that jumped out at me when I was researching this is that, you know, there'd been much made about the fact that Harris is the first presidential candidate who's actually visited an abortion clinic. Well, so has Walls. So we've now got a presidential candidate and a vice presidential candidate who have visited an abortion clinic. And I'm thinking, you know, even 15, 20 years ago on a Democratic ticket, you know, how much the world has changed since the fall of Roe, that that never would have been something that anybody would have, you know, sort of wanted to advertise. I mean, it. I think it sort of speaks volumes as to really how big reproductive health is going to be going forward in this campaign. And they went together when they, they visited a clinic together in, in St. Paul earlier. So I think that speaks to it, too, to that it is a very important issue for both of them and that it is definitely going to be something the other side is going to really seize on and a, a point of distinction. 
Meanwhile, as Shafali alluded to, the Republicans continue to kind of bob and weave on health care issues. Republican vice presidential nominee J.D. Vance told the news site Notice earlier this week that the ACA is indeed on the agenda for a second Trump administration, although he didn't say exactly how. I think we're definitely going to have to fix the health care problem in this country, was his exact quote. Any hints what that might entail? Honestly, no. I think that everything that we've heard so far has really just put multiple things out on the table without giving any specifics. You know, they said the ACA repeal and replace still on the table. It depends, you know, on do we have a majority, do we have a minority in, in Congress? And what would that even entail given that we had the whole thing in 2017 where it didn't work out for them? And, you know, Trump has hinted at it back and forth and not been very clear. So we're, we're still not sure without more clarity from them. And what, the rest of what J.D. Vance said was Obamacare is still too expensive and a lot of people can't afford it. And if they can't afford it, they don't get high quality care. And we're going to give them high quality care. And my thought was, that would be great. How on earth do you plan to make Obamacare less expensive and care higher quality. That seems like a rather tall order, but a great goal. (laughs) And I mean, realistically, right, we don't have, as Sandia pointed out, a real record for J.D. Vance to look at. We do have a record for Donald Trump, but we don't have statements of principle or value that we can really attribute to him. We don't know what he really would do because we don't know what he believes in. And that I think is why we put so much attention in in the press and and I mean, why we've seen Democrats put so much attention on what Republican think tanks are talking about and what the people who would staff those administrations would say. That is why something like Project 2025 merits so much scrutiny, because those are the people who will be in power in institutions of government and potentially interpreting these kinds of vague sentences into actual policy that touches our lives. We don't know very much of what Donald Trump really thinks about health care because he wants it that way. He wants to keep all of his options open. But one of the things that we do know is that he's repeatedly promised not to touch Social Security or Medicare, the so-called third rails of American politics. He has specifically declined, however, to include Medicaid on that list of things that he won't touch. And now we're reading various proposals, as you mentioned, from Project 2025 to the Paragon Institute, which is run by a former Trump official, that are proposing various ways to scale back Medicaid, particularly federal Medicaid spending, possibly dramatically. Did they not learn from the 2017 repeal and replace fight that Medicaid, now that it covers like 90 million people, is kind of pretty popular? I mean, I think that even after that, we've had so many times that we've kind of seen in that administration trying to modify the ways that they can with with Medicaid. You know, we had the try to push for block grant proposals multiple times. We've had the work requirements try to come to fruition in multiple states before being struck down by the courts. And those things are still pretty popular. If you look at the documents put out by a lot of these think tanks, it's something that could be brought up again, including pulling back on expansion as a way that they see as really reducing federal spending, especially as they're trying to reduce you know, the national debt and just bring down costs in general. So pulling back on the federal match yeah. for expansion. Yeah, more to the point. Medicaid expansion is largely funded by the federal government. And so I think those are things that we could see given the history and the, the people that are working in those places and their connections to the former administration. And I do think it's worth noting that Trump has said right now that he would not want to touch Social Security or Medicare. I think we can also put some a few grains of salt, maybe some more salt in there, because that is also what he said when he ran for president in 2016. And again, I mean, that isn't really what he was as committed to as president. It was this, what does Paul Ryan want to do? What will I be willing to negotiate on? And With Trump in particular, there is such a distinction between knowing what is politically pragmatic to say in a campaign versus what is on the table as an administration that I just think that it is incumbent on all of us to not take that with too much credibility just in this very specific case. And also, Social Security and Medicare sometimes need touching. Um, Saying that you're not going to touch and leaving them on, you know, autopilot uh, is not a very good, it's not a very responsible public policy. Um, You actually do have to get under the hood occasionally and and do things to these programs. But before we get to that, I want to talk a little bit more about abortion. This week, the Society of Family Planning, which is tracking the number of abortions around the U.S. in the wake of the Dobbs ruling, reported that the volume of abortions continues to increase despite complete 
complete bans in 14 states and near bans in several others. Shafali, how is this happening? Why is the number of abortions going up? One would think it would be going down. I think these numbers are really striking. They show a continuation of a trend, which is largely this increase in telehealth. More people getting abortion through in some cases, shield law provision, living in states like Texas and getting pills mailed to them from doctors in New York, or the fact that it is simply easier to get an abortion if you live in a state with abortion protections because telehealth is much more available right now. The numbers also do show more in clinic care because people are traveling and overcoming great distances to get abortion. One thing that I think is really important and that that the authors had, had noted when this came out was these go through March. And on May 1st, Florida's abortion ban took effect. And that is one of the biggest abortion bans that we have seen since the Dobbs decision. And I think it will be really interesting to see whether the trends that we have been observing for quite some time, this steady increase and in particular growth of telehealth and continued travel, if that remains possible and viable when you lose a state with as many clinics and as many people as Florida had had. I saw Stephen Miller, the Trump advisor on TV last night, talking about, you know, there will be no national abortion ban under Donald Trump, which is a whole nother discussion. But these numbers and continuing to go up must be making the anti-abortion movement kind of crazy. They are losing their minds. They are deeply frustrated on, on two levels. They are very concerned that people are finding ways to travel. That is not something they hoped for. And they are very concerned about telehealth in particular. And what they keep saying is they want to find some kind of legal strategy to challenge the shield law provision. But they haven't quite figured out how. There is real talk in Texas among some of the anti-abortion activists. They're trying to see, is there a way we could pass legislation in a future session to perhaps ban internet providers from showing the websites that allow you to order medication abortion, something like that. All of this would be fought through the courts. All of this would be heavily litigated. But it is their number one priority because it is an existential threat to abortion bans. Obviously, they are waiting to see what happens in the presidential election, because if you do have an administration that is willing to restrict the ability to mail Mifepristone through, you know, rehabilitating the Comstock Act, not passing a national abortion ban, but using older laws on the books, then that does some of the job for them and could very significantly put a dent in or even halt this trend. Well, speaking of the abortion pill, we're seeing pressure campaigns from both sides now aimed at some of the big corporations, including Costco and Walmart, that could start selling the abortion pill in their brick and mortar pharmacies. This is something that the Food and Drug Administration at least started to make easier earlier in the Biden administration. Now we have institutional investors from blue states pushing companies to carry the drug to make it more available or else they will divest their very large stock holdings, while we have institutional investors that represent anti-abortion groups like the American Family Association, who are threatening to divest if the companies do start selling the abortion pills. Um, I would not like to be on the board of any one of these big corporations right now. This seems like a rather uncomfortable place for them to be. Yeah. And, you know, none of this is surprising. Alice Olstein, regular contributor to this podcast, broke a really great story gosh, a year and a half ago now when we saw that even CVS and Walgreens for a time didn't want to distribute mifepristone in states where abortion was legal, but there were threats of litigation from attorneys general. And right, that has changed. The story points out that we have CVS and Walgreens carrying these pills and distributing them. But a lot of people do get medication from Costco. A lot of people do get medication from Walmart. What we'll see is that this is just another way in which the fight over abortion, which has real meaning for so many people just continues to play out in the corporate sector. It is something that has been true since Dobbs happened. It is just another sign of how much people care about this and the money behind it and the kind of chaotic nature of banning a procedure in some states and heavily stigmatizing it even in others. The ripple effect of the Dobbs decision, I really do think the Supreme Court had no great appreciation for just how far into other facets of American life this was going to spread, which it definitely is. Well, even as abortions are going up, states with abortion bans are spending increasing amounts of taxpayer money on anti-abortion crisis pregnancy centers that try to talk pregnant people out of terminating their pregnancies. This is kind of flying under the radar, I feel like. We've seen these crisis pregnancy centers have been around for a very long time. But what we haven't seen is the amount of money that states are now saying, well, we see we care about pregnant women, even though we're banning abortion, because we're giving all this money to these 
crisis pregnancy centers. And I was pretty struck by just how much money we have seen states put into these centers since the Dobbs decision. The the report that that you highlight, Julie, found that it was almost five hundred million dollars across all these states has gone in since twenty twenty two. That's almost half a billion dollars going into these centers. And you're right that they do fly in some ways under the radar. And part of that is because it is very hard to know how they spend that money. They have very, very little accountability built in place. They are not regulated the way that healthcare systems are. That also means if you're a patient and you go there for seeking health care, you are not protected by HIPAA necessarily. And you often will get quote unquote care that can be inaccurate or misleading because fundamentally these institutions exist to try and deter people from getting abortions, from staying pregnant and having children. I do think that we will see more and more of this happen. And in some ways, Republicans have been very overt about that. This was the focus of the March for Life. We saw a bunch of bills in Congress that Republicans put forth talking very specifically about federal funding for anti-abortion centers. This was the biggest trend we saw in state houses this year when it came to abortion was passing bills that would add more funding for anti-abortion centers. It's one area where they feel like the political consequences are far less than than bans because bans are unpopular and people don't fully understand and know what these are. And so they're not going to get as upset with you when they hear, oh, you put more money into these places that are supposed to help pregnant people, even though the reality is we don't actually have any metrics or data that show that they do. And we do have a lot of journalism that shows that they mislead people. Yeah, I will I will put the link back to the good uh, investigation that ProPublica did that we talked about a couple of weeks ago about how the, all the money in Texas is impossible to track, basically. All right. Well, uh, the Senate last week followed the House's lead and recessed until early September, which leaves them just a few legislative days when they get back to either finish up all 12 of the regular spending bills. Spoiler, that is not going to happen. Or else pass some sort of continuing resolution to keep the government open after the October 1st start of fiscal 2025. Sandia, they went into this, we've said this before, with so much optimism, the Republicans, we're going to get these all done before October 1st. Where are we? (laughs) So at this point, we've gotten some work done, but it's very unlikely we would have things done before the end of September. So the House was on track initially to vote on the on the House floor on their labor HHS spending bill. But it kind of got derailed after there were some issues whipping another bill, the energy water bill, and after they'd fallen short on their legislative branch spending bill, they recessed early. And we early. should point out that while labor H is always hard to pass, those other ones tend not no, to be. Those no. are the ones that usually go through. Yeah, labor H generally is done near the end of the whole slate just because it is notoriously one of the trickier ones to get all the agreement on, and it is the biggest non-defense spending bill. So it, it takes longer. And so less far along on the progress with that. And we're, you know, we're in August recess. Both chambers are out. We won't see any progress until September. Before the Senate left, they did advance their spending bill on the committee level. That went a lot differently than the House's markup. So, you know, we had three people opposed, but everyone else was pretty much in agreement. Just a lot less eventful. It wasn't focused on amendment debate. And it was bipartisan, which is which is a big thing. So we will see it kind of when they come back, if they gravitate a little bit more towards this, if they're shifting a little bit in between the two bills. But I think another thing to keep in mind is they have so little time this year to get so much done. Um, you know, they have so much recess this year for the election that it really puts a crunch on their timeline. And then, you know, there are certain people advocating that, you know, if this person wins, if that person wins, like, should we do a shorter term plan so that spending bill so that we can get our priorities in if this party's in control, this party has more control. So it's it's a difficult situation. Yeah, here we are basically heading into the home stretch for the spending bills with gigantic question mark, as usual. Every year they say, this won't happen next year. Every year, this happens next year. Well, meanwhile, this is our mid-year reminder that Congress also has to pass a bunch of other bills to do things like preventing some pretty big cuts to Medicare physician pay, to keep community health centers uh, and safety net hospitals up and running. Um, And they have to do all this by the end of the year. I assume we're still looking at a post-election lame duck session to try to wrap everything together. I think that's kind of what we're looking at. I mean, the big priority is going to be to get the government funded. 
And, you know, I think as with previous years, it will we get some of these other things tacked onto there? Will we get, you know, extension of telehealth flexibilities or some of the PBM reform or some of the other things that we've been discussing at the committee level and hoping to get across the finish line? But it's really difficult, I think, to get some of those things done until we have this broader package. And I think it's important that, you know, some of the times when we get the broader package, it can help pay for other the programs that we've been considering at the committee level. So that was just what I was going to say. The PBM reform in particular saves money. Gee, you can <laughs> prevent the physician pay cut and fund community health centers. Yeah. So I think a lot of it will depend on how quickly they're able to get to an agreement. And, you know, if you look at the differences between the House and the Senate bills, it's billions of dollars. You know, I think just on health spending, it was like almost 16 billion difference in like the top line number between the bills. So getting to some sort of middle ground is is going to take some time to kind of get there. Well, before we leave the Hill for the rest of the summer, the Senate Health Education, Labor and Pensions Committee, where Democrats and Republicans have not always seen eye to eye under Chairman Bernie Sanders, actually came together last month to open an investigation into and issue a subpoena to the CEO of Steward Healthcare. You may remember we talked about Steward back in May. It's a Dallas-based physician-owned hospital group that was sold to a private equity firm, which promptly sold the real estate the hospitals were sitting on, forcing them to then pay rent. Then the private equity group basically cashed out. And now the hospitals are floundering financially, uh, which is threatening patient care in several states. This is the first time the committee has issued a subpoena since 1981. I did not know that before this week. Um, and it's kind of a big deal. I mean, this is a this is the first, I think, I feel like big investigation, at least among this committee, about the consequences of private equity in health care. Yeah, I would say that. And especially because this is this is bipartisan. And I think there have been so many bipartisan issues over the past couple of years that it has been difficult to get the chairman and the ranking member to kind of see eye to eye on or to prioritize in the same order. And so this I really do think it is a big deal to be able to issue that subpoena and have um, the CEO come in in September. Yeah, this will be interesting. I mean, there have been, you know, Bernie Sanders made a big point of dragging up some of the drug company CEOs who said pretty much what we expected them to say. But I mean, this is a little bit of a different situation. And there's a bunch of senators from both parties who have hospitals in their states that are now being threatened by the bankruptcy of Stewart Healthcare. So we'll see how that goes. Speaking of profiteering in healthcare, we have two really excellent stories this week on pretty much the same subject. Stat News, as part of its continuing investigation into the way United Healthcare is squeezing extra money out of the Medicare program, particularly the Medicare Advantage program, has a piece on the use of a questionable test that's used to diagnose peripheral artery disease, which can dramatically increase the Medicare Advantage payment for a patient who has it, just kind of coincidentally. Along similar lines, the Wall Street Journal has a story looking at how not just United, but other major Medicare Advantage insurers, including Humana and Aetna, are using the same test, often provided during a, quote, free home visit by a nurse practitioner and scoring those very same extra Medicare Advantage payments. Now, I'm old enough to remember when the biggest knock on Medicare Advantage was that because it had fixed payments, it gave insurers an incentive to skimp on care. So we had lots of patients who couldn't get care that they needed. Now that the payments are risk adjusted, there's an incentive for insurers to give too much care, or at least to suggest that patients need more care than they do, like that maybe they have peripheral artery disease when they don't really. Are there any suggestions floating around how to fix this? I mean, Shafala, you were sort of alluding to this, that, that Medicare Advantage in particular can be a little bit of a sinkhole for federal funds. I think this is something that we we have struggled with for a long time, right? And I think I was like always thrilled to see a Bob Herman byline and we get another one on this stat story. And one thing that he has written about so compellingly is the, the sheer power that healthcare providers have have. And I think we just can't really ignore the role that they play then in being able to get all of this federal money into their system for things that we don't necessarily need. And that's not an easy thing to address politically because people like their hospitals. And even when you hear from lawmakers who want to talk about better regulation of hospitals, they really only talk about for-profit hospitals, even though if you were to go to a for-profit or not-for-profit, you might see some similarities in how they approach what they bill for. And this is something that we haven't figured out a good solution to because of how our politics work. But 
I'm really grateful that we get more reporting like this that helps remind us just how skewed the incentives are in our system. Yeah, I mean, and these it's hard to blame them. These are for-profit companies that have shareholders, and their job is to figure out how to make money for their shareholders, and they do it extremely well. But the money that they're making is coming from U.S. taxpayers, and there are patients who are kind of caught in the middle. I mean, it's just, it's been a thorny issue. It, this has been what we've been fighting about with Medicare for Medicare's entire 59 years of its existence. So I guess that will continue while we try to, to figure out everything else, like making this year's budget work. Finally this week, we reported in July how Michael Bloomberg gave his alma mater, Johns Hopkins University, another billion dollars that will, among other things, eliminate medical school tuition for most of its student body. We pointed out at the time that the schools that have gone tuition-free have not actually succeeded, either in getting more students to go into primary care, there's the concern that if you have a lot of debt, you're going to want to go into a specialty to pay it off, um, nor has it enabled more students of color to become doctors. So now Bloomberg is making his philanthropy be a little bit more direct. He's giving a combined $600 million to the four historically black colleges and universities that have their own medical schools, including Howard here in D.C., in hopes of more directly addressing equity issues that go along with patients not being able to get culturally sensitive care. HBCUs educate the vast majority of the nation's black doctors. So is this finally a step in the right direction with the uh, medical education and health equity? I would argue it is. I mean, like you said, we if you look at the data, the American Association of Medical Colleges said that half of black doctors graduate from one of these schools. And that could really increase some of the uptake of preventative care and trust in medicine in the black community, who I think they've done some polling that, you know, are more comfortable a lot of times with other black doctors. And I think that another point was, you know, the money is also starting another medical school to kind of like increase that pipeline as well. And that is another kind of big thing where it's, you know, broadening the pipeline, but also just really feeding into these schools should be big over time. A, a continuing uh, effort, I think, there. All right. Well, that is the news for this week. Now it's time for our extra credit segment. That's when we each recommend a story we read this week. We think you should read, too. As always, don't worry if you miss it. We will post the links on the podcast page at kffhealthnews.org and in our show notes on your phone or other mobile device. Sandia, you got first pick this week. Why don't you tell us about your extra credit? So I chose I Had a Body Part Repossessed, Post 9-11, amputee vets say VA care is failing them. And it's by Hope Hodgsek at The War Horse. And it is just a really excellent piece looking at, you know, some of the concerns that amputee vets have been having and kind of what the shortcomings are in the care from the VA, you know, not having bills paid for some of the prosthetics or just delays in receiving them. And one interesting issue that was brought up there is that you know, VA care for post 9-11 amputee veterans doesn't take into account some of the needs for that population. They're very different from maybe the needs of, you know, senior veterans. And, you know, it goes into more about how Capitol Hill is hearing some of these concerns. But um, read the story and learn more. Shafali. This is from KFF Health News. It is by Stephanie Armour. It is on a topic we discussed earlier on this podcast. The headline is Inside Project 2025 former Trump official outlines hard right turn against abortion. And what I love about this piece is it does a great job going into detail about the reproductive health ideas and agenda that is outlined in Project 2025. But I also really love that it ties that to the people who are involved in Trump world, right? And it talks about who are the people who wrote this. Um, Roger Severino, obviously a huge name, very anti-abortion, was involved in Trump's HHS when he was president last time. And Head of the Office of Civil Rights. <laughs> exactly, um, which has huge implications for abortion policy and reproductive health policy. And I think that Stephanie does a really great job of getting into the political back and forth that has emerged over Project 2025, in which Trump himself has tried to distance himself from the document, from what it outlines and what it says. But that doesn't really stand up to scrutiny when we look at the authors, because it is largely people who have worked for Trump, have advised him, and are likely to have influential roles coming forward. There's also some ties between J.D. Vance and the folks at Heritage and Project 2025 that really solidifies the notion that this is something that could be very influential in dictating what our country would look like under a Trump fans presidency. 
And I appreciate Stephanie's work in clarifying what it says. Yeah, it's a really good story. Well, my extra credit this week is a study in JAMA Internal Medicine. It's from the Cambridge Alliance at Harvard, and it's called Health Access to Care and Financial Barriers to Care Among People Incarcerated in U.S. Prisons. And it looks at something that I didn't even know existed, co-pays required in prisons for prison inmates in order to obtain medical care. The study found, not surprisingly, that co-pays can be equal to more than a week's wage for some inmates who often make just pennies an hour for the work that they do behind bars, and that many inmates end up going without needed care because they can't afford said co-pays. Uh, it's pretty eye-opening, and I hope it gets some attention. Okay, that is our show. As always, if you enjoy the podcast, you can subscribe wherever you get your podcast. We'd appreciate it if you left us a review. That helps other people find us too. Special thanks, as always, to our technical guru, Francis Ying, and our editor, Emery Huneman. As always, you can email us your comments or questions. We're at what the health, all one word, at kff.org, or you can still find me at X. I'm at J. Robner. Sandia? At Sandia Wrights. Shafali. At Shafali L. We will be back in your feed next week. Until then, be healthy.